Um, yeah, so uh, thank you very much for the great introduction and for having me here. Um, it feels a little bit weird to be speaking to a CMPS chapter knowing that I'm going to be the, the ED, but, but I'm still part of Calforo right now. And, uh, and talking about an early detection program that, that was put together years ago by a big coalition of partners, including Cindy Rosler, um, Andrea <coughs> Williams, Giselle Block of Fish and Wildlife Service, um, a whole bunch of folks in the Nine County Bay Area uh, to, try and, to try and protect the ecosystems and habitats and plants and bugs and animals that we really like. Um, so, um, so that's what I'm focusing on tonight, and hopefully I'll be able to come back soon and talk about uh, CMPS with you guys. Do you, you take questions at the end? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'll speak fast so there's plenty of time. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today focuses really on protecting habitats or protecting the things that we love. So I want to show a few slides of things that we love, you know, native plants and native habitats. And you guys get it. Um, these are in here um, just to remind me that it's, it's really about protecting the good things. It's not about going after bad plants. There really is no such thing. Um, but there are, there are good stories, there are evolutionary lineages that tell us something about places and about evolution and just about the underlying structure of the universe, about how plants adapt to their, their place. Climate control. And we care about them because, we care about these things because, you know, they provide food and they provide habitat for other organisms that we care about. Uh, and these are all, these are all plants and animals in our Bay Area. Um, they're just totally beautiful. Um, they're bigger than our head. <laughs> Show that photo. Um, and then for, for folks who kind of get pointy-headed about things, um, they tell us something interesting about how, how, how everything works. Um, they show us that everything is constantly changing, that every, every place has its own plants. Even if they look the same as plants at another place, there's constant selection and evolution going on. And it's not in any direction, it's just haphazard. Things are always changing. When you have, you can have a, a mutant of baby blue eyes, Nemophila menziesii, and, and that can turn into a subspecies or variety, I can't remember which, the, the white baby blue eyes, which is very restricted, and it's not a rare plant, but it's not as common as our blue baby blue eyes. But even within that, you have evolution <coughs> taking place, and you have blue baby blue eyes emerging in this. It's just constantly changing. Um, these are like living crystals, just always evolving. And there's, there's a pleasure in being able to look at these things and understand how the universe works a little bit and see kind of the underlying mathematics of the universe expressed in the shape of flowers. And so this is why we're trying to protect them. And as you know, we're protecting native plants um, against a lot of things that can do them harm. The number one threat to native plants, to biodiversity in the Bay Area, in California, in North America, the world, um, the number one threat is still habitat loss, development. This is a, this is a blueprint of West Marin. <laughs> Um, Muir, Muir Beach is right, dare I risk it, Muir Beach is right there. And, and this was part of a plan um, in, the, in the late 50s, early 60s, to do to West Marin what had been done to, um, to the coast of Orange County. Um, everyone knew that it was going to happen. We were going to put big 580 style freeways going over the hills to 101 style freeways along the coast. Um, there would be towns and cities all up and down the coast, Point Reyes National Seashore, wasn't a national seashore at one time. It was zoned um, for large communities of presumably folks who drive the freeways all the way up to Bodega Head and work at the reactor there uh, that powered all of these. And everyone just kind of figured that that, you know, I'm not sure that everyone liked it, but there was a time when Marin was the most pro-development county and everyone just kind of understood that this was the nature of progress until folks got agitated and, and made a fuss and started protecting those properties. Um, um, started voting each other onto things like the, the water district, the Marin Municipal Water District. Um, they, got a, they got a majority on the water district, did the math, found that there wasn't enough water to support all the homes, um, and put a moratorium on new water hookups. It was basically, it was pretty logical. It did a lot of good things, including slowing, slowing unsustainable development in West Marin. Um, and a lot of people liked that, and they started voting environmentalists onto the Board of Supervisors, and they put in a zoning, they changed zoning to protect uh, the beautiful wild areas of Marin. And now Marin went from, that helped Marin go from being the most pro-development county in California at one time to the most pro-environment county in California. And I just like to celebrate the successes that we've had in protecting a lot of the stuff that we care about. Um, there's still a lot of really good stuff out there after a few decades of humans going crazy on the landscape. 
And this is a map. This is a map of that celebration. And the green spots show you protected lands in the Bay Area. This is the protected lands network of the Bay Area, about a million acres, and we're adding more every day. Um, I think we had a million acre goal and, and surpassed it before the, before the, the deadline. I can't remember if it's 2010 or whatever, but we're doing a decent job. We need to do better, of course, um, but we're saving a lot of things from development, mm -hmm. which means that folks who are managing those protected areas, mm -hmm. lands that have been protected from development, face the number two threat to biodiversity, and that's biological invasions. Um, and it's not just plants, it's diseases and, and animals and all kinds of stuff. Um, but we've got things like Cape ivy, um, a, a somewhat rare plant in South Africa. Folks looking for biocontrol agents to, to try and control Cape ivy here in California, where it's spreading like crazy, um, where it's covering our coastal zones. Folks looking for biocontrol agents have a hard time finding them there um, because the plants are very uncommon. They're up in cloudy forests, um, and, uh, and, and, and there's very few, bug, very few plants. It's hard to find them, and it's hard to find the bugs that are keeping them in check. Um, here, where, they, where they've been introduced without their natural enemies, they're spreading. When I first started getting into, um, um, when I first started really committing to this stuff in 1990 or so, um, when Jake, Jake Sig of San Francisco introduced me to things, um, I, I learned about Cape Ivy, and we all knew that Cape Ivy was a bad plant um, in, the, in the Golden Gate, basically, where, where it required the fog to persist, and we were all very thankful that it wouldn't spread. And then I found some in San Diego and found some in Baja, California, and now we know that we were wrong on that, that it's spreading all over the place. So it's one of those invaders that we care about. Mm -hmm. Another one that we care about is Sudden Oak Death. Uh, this, is, this is a disease that was introduced accidentally. No one wants it here. It's, it, it, it wasn't done on purpose. Um, it was just a stowaway that's having dramatic consequences, um, reshaping the forests uh, that, that so many things depend on, until Cindy, Cindy manages to find a cure for it. Um, she has some really cool experiments underway. I'm sure you, half you guys probably already know about this stuff. Um, but that's an important, an important microorganism that's changing things. Another microorganism that is a biological invader is um, affecting the yellow-billed magpie, a bird that really is essentially endemic to California. Um, it's found within, basically within California and, and goes over the border a little bit into some large valleys. Um, it likes these big, large valleys. Um, Hyper-intelligent, super social, it's kind of a cross between a jay and a crow. If anything can survive with humans, it's this bird, and it does quite well, um, or at least it did until we introduced West Nile virus accidentally. Um, and this bird is especially susceptible to West Nile virus, and it likes those large valleys that often have farm equipment uh, with standing water in it that breeds mosquitoes. And so we've been seeing dramatic declines in populations of these birds over the last few years, and, and, um, and there's some, some concern that it could just go extinct under our eyes um, with millions <coughs> of bird lovers wishing they could do something about it, but unable to do it as we got a disease into the system that once you've opened Pandora's box, you can't put the things back in. And then coastal dunes are affected by biological fear. So this is, I think, this is the last of the, you know, of the downer slides. Um, and you guys, you guys already know this. Um, um, but I just kind of want to, before getting into the solutions and how we're going to fix things, kind of revisit what the problem is. Um, and so this is, this is the bad part. You know, movie, you gotta, you gotta build tension before you... <laughs> um, but this is European beach grass, the Mothma Arnaria, introduced to stabilize coastal, to stabilize coastal dunes, um, um, in particular to protect railroad tracks and roads and things like that, that that are adversely affected by blowing sand. And it does a good job of that. It's a good engineer, um, uh, it's a, a useful tool, um, and, and we planted it far and wide since the early 1900s. And it's spread into coastal dunes that are fairly, fairly sensitive systems with a lot of rare, rare plants and animals. Um, and be, as you can see in the large picture there, it, it does a good job of stabilizing the dunes and pretty much closing up all the active, dynamic, living sand dunes that, that really are important for, for these little dune plants and dune critters that depend on moving sand, that can tolerate these stressful, tough conditions um, where they have a little refuge from competition and, and and other things that regulate their populations elsewhere and, able, and are able to persist with the moving sand. So this is, this is a plant doing something. It's, it's, we planted it to do something, and now we've decided that we don't like it. Um, and so the, the big picture on this is that these are biological invasions are just kind of a consequence of having a sentient species on a small planet moving around um, and moving things around. And, um, and 
to put it in a larger perspective, once upon a time, we, we basically had one continent, Pangaea, um, and had one continent's worth of biological diversity. Um, since then, do they have a good continental drift? Um, since then, over the last 250 million years or so, uh, plate tectonics has separated the continents and given us separate continents and separate zoogeographic realms. Um, and that was part of the inspiration. Wallace's zoogeographic realms uh, were part of the inspiration that led Darwin to come up with the theory of evolution by natural selection. They're really very different places, uh, the five zoogeographic realms. Um, more recently, we're reconnecting those zoogeographic realms into a supercontinent uh, with our shipping. In the slides here, the top screen shows shipping channels of the world. And you can see we've got that pretty well covered. And the bottom slide shows roadways of the world. So, roadways. So, we've got the Earth covered pretty well, to a first approximation. We have a significant footprint, and we're moving things around a lot. Um, and, that's, and that means that we're introducing things, oftentimes um, deliberately, uh, for the most part, to everyone's benefit. We like, we like having access to all kinds of cool things from all over the world. Um, but sometimes we make, a bad, we make a, a bad call on what we're introducing, and more often we, we have stowaways that, are, that we're moving accidentally. And this is a graph of um, non-native plants in California, number of non-native plants in California over time, from the earliest botanical records up through other records, to I believe 2002's uh, 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 paper by Fred Russo listing non-native plants in California in 2002. Um, not all of these are weeds, not all of them are harmful, but it's kind of an index of the rate of introduction. And when you look at this, you can see that not only are we continuing to introduce things, but the rate of introduction is increasing. And so this is really the problem that we're trying to address with early detection networks. Um, and it's, it's something that we know that we can make some headway on, because we've done the same thing uh, with human health. We've done it, we've seen this problem before, and we've solved it with regard to human health. Um, we're, we're moving things around because there are a lot of people moving at a fast rate. Um, and we faced similar problems when human populations in Europe began increasing and folks began moving to the large cities, started forming large cities. And it was just kind of accepted that large cities had great, that great cities had great epidemics, in particular cholera. Um, you had a lot of people living on top of each other, moving around, um, and you didn't have the tools you needed to prevent epidemics. Um, during one particularly bad cholera outbreak in London, Dr. John Snow decided to, to make a little map of deaths, and, and that's this map here. And each of the black boxes is a place where someone died of cholera during this one outbreak. And he looked at the map and realized that they all kind of clustered around the Broad Street pump, the Broad Street well. And he petitioned the burghers, the town elders, to let them shut down the pump um, and, and made a fuss and at first uh, met with resistance and uh, they, they saw no connection. Everyone knew that cholera was caused by bad air or something like that, I think dirty fumes. And, um, but he was successful, he was um, annoying, and I guess they led him to take the handle off the pump uh, so that people could quit using it. People were forced to stop using the pump. And the epidemic burned itself out. They dug up the well, they found that people's sewers plumbed right into the well. And they were crapping and drinking it and spraying cholera. Um, and, and this really was important for a couple of reasons. Um, it was a landmark in the creation of a epidemiology, of mapping things to try and identify threats early um, so that you can deal with them. And secondly, um, promoting hygiene, um, discovering some of the causes of these diseases, of these biological invaders that were, that were harming human health. And those are two fundamental tools that we've used to protect human health, so that now we live in a world of fantastic diversity, where people can move all around the planet, um, where we live at tremendous population density, density that you never would have thought humans could, could live, and we bear the lowest disease burden of human history. And we do this because we have epidemiology, we invest in detection um, and rapid response, and we have basic <coughs> hygiene that protects us from, from biological invaders. And we can apply these tools to protect natural systems as well. Um, and it's not just me saying so. Um, the Ecological Society of America is really the fundamental professional organization for ecological scientists. Um, <laughs> and and their, their white paper on recommendations for management of biological invaders um, makes the case, I mean, I have a, I have a simpler slide. Um, basically, we have to first, pr first pr practice exclusion. You prevent, you prevent invaders from um, making it in and establishing. Um, uh, next, you have early detection so that when things have made it through your exclusion, um, you can find them and deal with them early. 
Um, you try and eradicate them wherever possible. Where that's not possible, then you need to manage it. Many human diseases are not eradicable, um, but we have tools to manage the ones that actually impact um, humans in an important way. And then throughout all of this, you need public education and, and ongoing research so that people understand what you're doing. Um, people support it, people are engaged, and you're advancing the technology to be able to do a better job tomorrow. And so this is, that early detection rapid response is fundamental to a lot of strategic plans for, for National Park Service, um, uh, State Parks, Fish and Wildlife Service. A lot of agencies tasked with managing and protecting biodiversity have a commitment to early detection rapid response. But it's kind of hard to do. You need to operate on a scale that's really significant. Um, you need to be coordinated across a lot of agencies and entities. You need to have good data and good science. Um, it's the kind of stuff that an individual land manager or even an agency is hard pressed to do. Um, uh, and, and so we haven't been doing a great job of it until somewhat recently. Um, and a number of land managers and scientists and just concerned citizens got together in 2006 to see if we could team up, pool our resources, and do a better job. And 2006, we had our kickoff meeting of the Bay Area Early Detection Network, uh, where I think about 50 people got together, had a day-long meeting to review what other early detection networks have done, come up with a basic framework for what we were going to try and do. Um, and, then, uh, and then find a few folks who were willing to put the effort into doing some fundraising to get the resources to flesh out that framework and get the network going. It took, a, and, and so the basic principle here, as you can see, is um, you do some math to figure out what species are going to be bad in the future. And we have good math on this. Lots of folks have done their dissertations or the master's theses or published scientific papers. Um, so we have mathematical tools with a, that will let you, with a high degree of certainty, predict what will be a problem in the future. Um, it's kind of getting a, it's like getting a letter from the future saying, watch out for that plant. If we could send a letter in a time machine to the past, we'd say, watch out for yellow star thistle and French broom. 1912, there's 10 plants, get them now. Um, and we can, we can get that letter from the future to a certain degree. Um, then, then we find where those things are today. We prioritize those so we go after the most important occurrence first and, and, and work our way down the list until we run out of money. Keep good keep track of what we're doing so that we can show our results, so that we can improve our practice where it's not working, and show our results and ask for more money so that we can get back to our list and keep going down it. And so that's the basic principles of the Bay Area Early Detection Network. There's our kickoff meeting in 2006, of the folks who stuck around for the group photo. And um, um, it took a couple years, um, but we were able to develop funding to support full-time staff for Baden. And that was an important priority um, for Baden. We, we didn't want the hard worked natural areas managers to be doing another volunteer task, running, running another um, organization in their so-called spare time. Um, we wanted to bring new, more capacity to the system, find full-time staff who could make it their mission. Um, and with funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Federation, from the California Department of Food and Ag, Fish and Wildlife Service, and then, um, thank God, stimulus funding via the Forest Service, uh, we were able to hire a couple full-time staff to get paid and going. Aviva Rossi on the right uh, was Baden coordinator at the same time as Mike Perlmutter um, on the left. And uh, Aviva went out on maternity leave a year or so ago, a year and a half, I think. And, uh, and so for the last year, uh, Mike Perlmutter has been running some of the, some of the work that I'm going to tell you about. Um, one of the first things that we did once we had the staff going was do outreach to partners. Um, and we really tried to do kind of a narrow casting thing. We didn't just broadcast. But we tried to get news out in every newsletter, every bulletin, every, every venue that would let us get in touch with other land managers, with volunteers, with folks who had an interest in this stuff, so that they would know that we were trying to pull this together and have an opportunity to get involved and help shape it, um, so that folks would know that there was going to be a call for data um, uh, to, for occurrences of plants, and basically give everyone a chance to be involved so that we would all, be, we would all participate in forming it. We would all have some degree of faith in this thing, um, and be willing to kind of trust it with the emotional energy and the resources to actually get some stuff done. So we, we really tried to make sure that everyone had a chance to be involved. And we did a pretty good job. Here's a few of those. Um, and that, that really helped us for the next phase, which was mapping occurrences of invasive plants that were likely to be um, important early detection targets. And um, to do this, um, at this time I was working, with Audubon, working for Audubon Canyon Ranch and not with Cal Flora, but this was kind of what got me interested in Cal Flora in a really substantial way. We used Cal Flora as the database of occurrence information, and Baden um, contracted with Cal Flora to build a couple new tools that let people map plants and report information a little bit more easily. 
Um, initially, that included a web application that still works quite well. Um, uh, Audubon Canyon Ranch contracted to make a, a phone mapping, a phone app, smartphone app for mapping plants, um, which we're revising now to, to be an even better field tool. Um, we have geotag photo uploading. Um, so that folks with GPS cameras or just smartphones can take photos of plants and then upload them and it automatically pulls the location off the photo. Um, and then some tools for uploading data sets, in particular shape files and, and other data sets maintained by agencies and land management entities. All that information about what plants are where went into CalFlora, uh, using CalFlora as the main database. Um, and that's kind of, these are all the, the data entry tools, this is the CalFlora database. And then we developed some tools to be able to download the data in ways that we could use in a GIS to do prioritization. And we did a couple rounds of prioritization. First thing we did was we pulled out all the non-native plants known to be in California, or rather, we went to California, pulled out all the non-native plants for the Bay Area. And, um, and we, we used this to try and identify what plants we should be screening to determine if they're gonna be a problem in the future. First thing that we did was we removed all the plants that were widely, that were abundant and widespread. They're not eradication targets. They're not early detection targets. Whether they're good or bad, whether they're harmful or beneficial, um, they're not eradication targets. Um, of the remaining plants, we did a weed risk assessment um, to try and identify those that were sparsely distributed. There's not many of them, and there are not at many places. Um, and they are known to cause harm elsewhere. They're likely to be harmful in, in California. Once we had that list, we ran it back past a bunch of experts who gave it a little bit um, who did what a machine and mathematical algorithms can, actually looked at it and said, you know, this is good, but I can see why you think that, but this one's not a problem, um, and gave us additional information that we used to, to narrow down that list to 73 species uh, that we had very good reason to believe were going to be harmful in the future if we didn't do something about them. Um, and here's that list of 73 species, one of the two pages after that list. And it doesn't matter if you can't read it because when I read it, I only recognized two or three names. They're plants that we don't, they're not widespread plants. They're not common plants. Um, they're, not, they're not in our daily lexicon. Um, and that's kind of the point. Uh, they're, newer, they're, they're new threats. So then we, we went back to the database and we pulled out all the location information for those plants. Came up with a long list of eight, something like 880 dots on the map. 880 something locations. Um, and then we used a new mathematical model developed by Gina Darren, a grad student at UC Davis who was funded by the Department of Food and Ag and the Forest Service to come up with a model that would let you prioritize occurrences for elimination towards eradication. Uh, and it includes a whole bunch of factors, proximity to roads, soil, longevity of seeds in the seed bank, ability to spot the plants from a distance, um, impacts to agriculture, impacts to the environment, impacts to rare plants, um, a whole bunch of factors go into this analysis. And at the end, you're able to prioritize those 880 plus dots on the map to know which dot is your highest priority, your second highest priority, your third highest priority, and on down. So once we had that list developed, um, we got to the on the ground work. And this was, oh, I'm sorry, uh, almost to the on the ground work, to almost on the ground work. Um, and, and the heart of Aiden is really coordinating early detection and rapid response. It's about working over a large area, the nine counties of the Bay Area, geographic and population size of Massachusetts, um, and having a single person who can, we believed that a single person would be able to coordinate early detection or rapid response over that area. Doesn't mean that a single person is gonna be able to go out and get all of those populations, but can coordinate the numbers, the math, the data mining, um, and then get that information out to the folks who can actually do the on the ground work. And the first step in that was to go through the list and work the phones and work email and contact everyone they could who had some responsibilities or some knowledge about those populations. And it was basically, you know, we would phone a land, Mike Perlmutter did most of this work, would phone a land manager and say, did you know you had this plant? Um, is it still there? Um, are you treating it? If not, why not? Um, and um, if, if it's a monetary problem, can we give you some money next year uh, to get it? And with that, we found that we were able to get a little bit more than a third of the populations under treatment voluntarily by land managers who, who um, you know, could take advantage of that information and go out and get these populations. Um, and, and that left the remaining populations, about a third, uh, we weren't able to verify using those techniques. Um, some of them may long be gone. Some of them may have a mall on top of them. They're older records. Um, and, then, um, and then some of them were present and required additional resources to be treated, about another third. So in year one, we got about a third treated voluntarily by Baden partners and others. Um, and then in the second year, we went back to the rest of those um, and provided funding 
uh, thanks to stimulus funding from um, the Forest Service, uh, we were able to provide funding to um, land managers, to contractors, to agencies, to whoever had responsibility for those properties uh, to go after the highest priority populations. So after, after the second year, we've, we were able to get about two-thirds of those populations under treatment. Um, this last year, um, we haven't had a lot of funding and it's kind of coasting along, so we don't have numbers on how many are being treated. Uh, but I think people are still buying into beta, and I think people are still supporting it. Um, and by people, I mean the land managers working on stuff. And I, I, I know that many of the populations, I still am getting reports from folks who are saying, oh yeah, we're, we're still going after that skeleton weed, it's a pain in the neck, we've got to get another permit from Caltrans, but we're going to get it. Um, so it's going. After a couple years of stimulus funding, stimulated work, um, we, we got a lot of stuff going. Um, and these are some of the entities doing rapid response to, to, to help treat those populations. Um, and these are some of the individuals doing it. That's not actually an early detection plant. That's French Broom at the Bolinas <laughs> Lagoon Preserve that I used to work at. But I, I just wrote those my gangs. I wanted to show it. Um, and, and, also, and also give a nod to the fact that much of the land management of the Bay Area is done with the help of volunteers. Uh, so we're, we, have, we have a lot. We're a lucky place to have a lot of folks who are really get it and are really dedicated. So here's a map showing, this is something that Mike threw, up, threw together. This is a map that Mike Perlmutter threw together after he had finished 50 calls and all 50 of the top 50 priority populations were under treatment. So he put together a map. Uh, a map with 800 plus dots, it's a lot more crowded. Uh, but that shows it. So the, Baden was a lot of hard work and a lot of luck and a lot of people um, made a big commitment to it. And as a result, it was able to get some good work done. We've, 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 we've changed, we've, to some degree, we have changed conservation in the Bay Area. Um, folks are focusing on early detection work. We've shown that we can, uh, with, a, with a rather limited budget, pull together the information um, and, and prioritize things and come up with, with an, enlightened, an enlightened action plan for dealing with biological invasions. It's not going to solve the invasion crisis, but it's going to help it to, to not get worse faster. Um, um, and, and I, I think the, the biggest success, the biggest evidence of the success of Baden is that a lot of the Baden partners are still involved, that folks still have some faith in it. Um, and there's a lot of initiatives that kind of have a lot of hoopla and then don't really continue uh, and just um, kind of tax your faith in things. Um, um, but Baden's not that. And another measure of Baden's success is that folks around California are saying that they want their own early detection networks. They want their own regional multi-county early detection networks. Folks in San Diego, in Humboldt, in Los Angeles area, in the Central Coast, are getting together to pull together early detection networks. And, and so we've been working to build, um, build a framework for that uh, that we're calling California Eden, a network of networks protecting California from invasive plants. Um, where each network is multi-county, so that if there's a leadership vacuum in one county, the other county can carry it along until there's a new ag commissioner hired or something. Um, so that we can aggregate resources over a large area. And so that we're coordinating response on an area that's biologically significant. So they're really kind of structured along these political boundaries with a fairly significant area. Um, uh, and, and that's one of the core principles of Baden that we think is important for the statewide networks. Um, and that's the kind of thing that, that, that a California Eden can do um, that just individuals putting things together can. California Eden can have, can generate principles and guidelines, can develop tools like the CalFlora tools that are now available to everyone anywhere in California, um, can put together systems for prioritizing, can do a lot of the work and share it among the networks, among the networked networks. Um, as new innovation comes out of networks, it can quickly be shared among the other partners. The idea is that we have multiple, separate, distinct early detection networks with their own culture, their own traditions, but using the same systems, working together in a way that's truly coordinated across the state. And so um, this, we've been working with California Invasive Plant Council. They've got some funding recently from the Landscape Conservation Cooperative to, to, to promote regional early detection networks. Um, and so over the next year or so, I think we're going to see California Eden revving up more early detection networks, like the one we have in the Bay Area, um, serving the rest of California. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about the CalFlora stuff that's, that's being used by this. And for me, the tools that CalFlora built for Baden um, showed me a lot of potential for, for the ability of all of us to pull together plant information that can be used to really advance conservation science. 
Um, and so the, the beta tools have been expanding. Kelp Flora started as a, a Forest Service database in, in a, let me go back to the Kelp Flora site. Started as a Forest Service database um, uh, before the age of the internet, and with the creation of Mosaic, it went to the World Wide Web, uh, where it was freely and publicly available ever since. And there's a couple million plant occurrences in Cal Flora. About a million of those are from the Consortium of California Herbaria. That all the herb, all the big herbaria of California team up and make those available uh, to Cal Flora to show to folks. And then another million are from all of us and everyone else, a variety of data sources. And then there's 21,000 site-specific checklists. And these are the kind of things that, that, that all of us in CMPS should care about. That's 21,000 checklists for sites that we may want to go hiking at or looking at. Mm -hmm which can be easily illustrated with, uh, with Cal photos, flip photos, and make great little instantly generated field guides. And there's tools for us getting our checklists in there um, so that that information can be used for conservation and science, and it can also be used by us on Saturday hikes. Um, so that's Cal Flora. Um, and I like Cal Flora because it's, um, it's one solution to this Tower of Babel that we're facing with plant location information. So these are the agencies, these are a handful of agencies in the Bay Area that are collecting plant location information. They're mapping plants. Um, they they want to know where plants are for their work. They're investing time and energy in mapping things, but they're using different techniques, different systems, collecting different data, doing it in different ways. A lot of the time the data just sits on a hard drive or sits on some paper in a filing cabinet. Um, very rarely is the data combined um, so that so that it can be used by multiple people. And it's like the biblical story of the Tower of Babel where they were all working together on, in common purpose until they started speaking different languages and when were unable to work together. And I think Cal Flora is one, one tool that we can use to, to translate that Tower of Babel so that we can begin working together more effectively. Um, and, and just to roll through some of these tools, you're probably all familiar with the, the taxon report on Cal Flora. That where you can click on these and get additional photos, and there's a distribution map of the plants. Uh, but there's a bunch of other a bunch of other tools that you can find. If you go to CalFlora and go to on the left-hand bar, there's a My CalFlora link. And you want to click on that, and it'll give you a toolbox of things. Things like this distribution analysis <coughs> that shows here kind of a heat map here for Salvia mellifera, and these are very useful. Not just you, you can also have it show dots um, to to show where these occurrences have been mapped. Um, so it's useful to find a plant to, to, to ID something and see if it is actually where you found it. And it's useful for conservationists in an era of climate change where, where we want to be able to look at this and identify important outlier occurrences which are genetically distinct, that are probably relictual populations from when, the, when, when climate was different and they've been stranded there. And these are important conservation targets. Um, these populations on the southern edge of the range are important conservation targets. They're going to get very stressed as conditions get warmer and drier. And land managers can look at this and say, okay, there, I've got one of those southernmost populations on my land. I'm going to go out and check it and see how it's doing. Similarly, land managers in the north can check their populations, um, where they have <coughs> genetically and ecologically <coughs> unique populations at the northern extent of its range. Um, you can just basically picture this blob of salvia mellifera is going to be trying to move north as climate does. Um, so when you have good maps, when you have good information for what's growing where, even just by glancing at the map, you can use it to make good conservation <coughs> plans. So what's the, the significance of the color? Oh, right. I'm sorry. And this is, this is a heat map. So dark red means that we have more occurrences mapped, and, and it fades through to light yellow, where there's very few occurrences mapped. It doesn't necessarily mean there's more plants or less, fewer plants. Um, it's, it's, it's about it's data driven. So, so there's always a challenge there where you, if you're looking at a light range one and you say, oh, it's all over, you can add a couple dots on the map and change that color. So there's always, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of information out there that, that we will be pulling in over the years uh, that's not there yet. Um, and these mobile tools are one important way to get that data in. So this is the, the smartphone app that we built. The CalFlora Observer works on iPhones and, and Android devices. It makes it really easy to just map something in the field. You don't need a cell phone signal. You don't need a cell phone plan. Um, all you need is a phone um, with a satellite view, and you can get a location fix, add a photo to it, add a little bit more data. When you get back to Wi-Fi, hit upload, um, and it goes to Cal Flora, um, where you can use it. Uh, you can also use the geotag photo upload tool um, that lets you upload any photo and start an occurrence record. If you have a GPS chip in your camera, if you have a GPS camera, which are now cheap 
great cameras. You can get a great little Canon or Nikon with a good lens, take good macro photos um, that will also add the location to the photo file. So you can just go out, snap your photos, upload it to Calflora, and those things have been mapped. So we're trying to create a diversity of tools for getting information in, and also trying to integrate with other tools that are out there. These are a couple of citizen science phone applications that folks have put together, iNaturalist and What's Invasive, um, that we're pulling those data into Calflora as citizen science feeds, where it doesn't automatically change the distribution analysis in Calflora because they're unconfirmed, they're citizen science, um, but, but the data are available there for land managers to take a look at and see if they can believe them and, and go out and investigate on their own. And then we've got a good old web application that you can just go to the website, click on a map, add a little more, add the species name, and hit save, and you've made a record. You can also use the same one to add additional information. In this case, Mike Perlmutter has added photos of the Limonium ramosissimum that they were mapping and pulling, uh, but of people doing it. Um, and it made it, you know, adding those photos and a little extra text, uh, mapped it, created a good accession record of that population, but it was an accession record that he could copy the website and and email it to all the volunteers and say, wasn't that fun? Here's some photos of our volunteer day. Be sure to come back Tuesday. <laughs> so there's, there's a potential to create a whole lot of tools. Every tool doing a different thing for a different user group, but all of them adding up to um, a shared system that lets us keep track of what's growing where. Um, anytime you put data into Calflora, you do it through your, you have to have a Calflora login. Um, so there it says I'm logged in through my account. And when you do, it all goes in under your name, unpublished. It's not publicly discoverable until you click on it and publish it. So this is one record. I'm clicking here and it's lighting up the, the dot right there. If you click on a dot, it zooms to that record. When you click on a record, you have a choice to edit it, add additional information, delete it, so that you, know, you delete your mistakes or your bad ideas or just when you're testing stuff out, um, or, or publish it. And when you publish it, then it's publicly <coughs> available. But we try and make it so that folks can get data in, um, but still have control over their information and, until they figure out their IDs um, you know, to make it public. So here's a, another map showing how we, how we can display uh, more, more, more spatially um, explicit information. These are, these are mapped populations of, um, I believe that's Scotch, Scotch broom up there. Yeah. Um, so you can see actually the shape of the population. And this is Google Maps. So one fun thing to do is to grab that little man and drag it down. And all the, load, all the roads light up in blue. So you can drag it down and get into just pop into Street View and, and, and zoom around and go, oh yeah, it's right there. Mm -hmm. It'll be a little blue dot hovering over the plant that was mapped. Mm -hmm. It's kind of crazy. Um, and all these data are being used by more partners. So we we provide these data to Cal Ipsy, the Invasive Plant Council, um, in their, to use in the Cal Weed Mapper, uh, which basically gives a 30,000 foot overview of invasive plants. So you can take a look at this. Each of these squares, each of these pixels is a quad, about 49 square kilometers. So a weed management area or a, someone working on a very large scale can take a look at this for, for a given species and identify you know, up in this area this plant might be an eradication target. Down here, it's not. Um, so we're working with Calypsy to provide this kind of information for a longer list of species to integrate more of the kind of early detection species, the baited species. And we're able to do a better job of that as we have more information about what's growing where. Um, and basically, the overall plan for where we're going is a gazillion different ways of getting information into the system. Basically, any way that someone is, anything that someone is doing that gets a plant location should have a plug on it so it plugs into Calflora and that location information isn't lost. Um, and that especially includes photographs. Um, I think that's. I think there's a, a lot of value in building tools so that all of us who love to go out and take photos are able to actually use those for conservation. Um, all that information goes into a shared database with all kinds of cool tools for viewing stuff, mapping stuff, crowdsourcing, identifications, all kinds of things. And then those data are available to professionals through the manager module that we're building now, which has integrated weed risk assessments that figure out which plants you should be worried about, whether they're weeds or natives. Um, helps you prioritize your occurrences to remove, to enhance, whatever. Um, and then potentially even gives you some recommendations about how you should go about doing it. Something like practices. Something like the practices that we use in human health. Where once upon a time, human health was done by, by doctors who just kind of had to hope that your doctor knew what they were doing. There, were, there weren't established practices for the most part. Um, and after World War II, folks did a few studies that showed that shockingly, even with great advances in medical technology, 
Um, one, one famous study was um, with obstetrics that showed that the survival of the mother and daughter, or mother and child, um, were greater if you gave birth at home than in a hospital. Even though the tools were better, they had all kinds of good drugs, all that kind of stuff, they didn't have good practices. And over the last few decades, we've seen the emergence of journals of systematic review that review practices. So now doctors have standard practices. You want your doctor to be imaginative and look at you as an individual and figure out exactly what you need. But it's nice that they can look it up, that there is a standard practice that they're trained in. And we think that we can generate those for biodiversity conservation, um, starting with simple rudimentary ones and improving as people generate, develop their portfolios of plants. Say a land manager puts together a portfolio of the plants on their preserve, prioritize it for treatment, assign what they're going to do and when, use the recommendation wizard to help pick their treatments, record what they did, record how it turned out, do some analysis, and then have that feedback into the, the recommendation wizard to improve practices in the future. So that over time, we're recording what we're doing, we're getting outcome information, we're able to improve what we're doing over time. So that's the kind of system that we're trying to build. Um, and the, the first, really, really it's all within what we're calling a, a manager module. Um, actually, I guess this is, put this slide together a couple weeks ago, and now it's, we're calling it the manager system because it's a bunch of things. It includes a nursery manager database um, that we're adapting from, um, we're converting a Microsoft Access database that's used by the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy. Um, has been used, Betty Young developed it, um, is using it at five native plant nurseries. Hundreds of staff have been using it for a decade or more. Um, so they know what they need. They know that this does the job. This is the system that they use to track seed collection, seed cleaning, germination rate, survival in this size of a pot with this kind of soil, um, and where the things get outplanted. So we're moving that into Calflora so that it will integrate with all the other things um, so that when someone collects some seeds, grows them up, and plants them out, people in the future can go to a database and say, that's where the seeds were collected, that's where the things got planted. I know that that's not that plant, that explained why the phylogeny on the, on the species looks weird because that plant is actually from Stanislaus, it's not a marine plant. Mm -hmm. So we can track that kind of information as we move things around more and more. And we can just do better propagation and better planting. So we're putting that in the web. Um, we're, we're taking a kind of a proprietary, kind of a very narrow focused weed information management system that a lot of land managers use and, and integrating that into Calflora so it's accessible through web browsers and integrated with all these other tools. Um, we're, we're building in the prioritization tools. Um, you probably remember I told you about the one that we used to prioritize those 880 dots um, for, for treatment. That's called WIPIT. And we've got funding from Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife Service to build that into CalFlor, to build it into the web, so that it can be used by any land manager anywhere um, to prioritize the invasive plants on their property. It's a simple step from prioritizing invasive plants for removal to prioritizing native plants for protection. And I'm hopeful that we can once we get this project done, um, it'll be a smaller project um, to build a system that helps you, that gives you, that searches through the California database to identify locally significant plant populations. A population of a plant that's abundant somewhere else but rare here. Um, population of something that is at the periphery of its range. Um, a, a patch that's growing someplace weird. It's a wetland plant, but this is a south-facing slope. All these kind of things that, you know, are fairly, there are good systems, Diane Lake, um, David Magney, folks have written how-to guides for this stuff. We just need to connect it with a database that has information about what's growing where. And then we can start showing people those dots. A land manager can go to the system and say, where are the locally significant plant populations on my preserve? Um, and, then, yeah, and then do something to protect them. Um, and then ultimately, we, I mentioned that we want to have, be able to give recommendations to land managers. Um, and, and we have some examples of this. This is the eVeg guide uh, that we built for Natural Resource Conservation Service. They, their conservation staff have these, these big three ring binders, the veg guides, that will go out to a landowner's property, equip landowner, um, and start flipping through it to give, come up with a planting prescription. And they'll take several hours looking at maps and doing math and doing all this and that. And after a few hours, they're able to give them a list of what plants they need to plant, how many pounds of seed per acre, that kind of thing. So they, they came to California and asked if, asked if it would be possible to speed that up a little bit. And, and with this, you now just click on, you, you click on that and it gives you a map. You click on where you are, where your site is on the map. It auto-populates a ton of the information you need. You go to your pull-down menu of your, these are standardized conservation practices. These are like federal practices from the Dust Bowl era. 
select your practice, select your sub-practice, say whether you want to limit it only to native plants or you want all the plants that are in that practice, that codified practice, are you going to irrigate a couple things. Within less than a minute, you can click, give me a report, and it gives you that planting list. Your, your plant's listed there, pounds of seed per acre, um, and the species name is linked to a Calflora taxon report that shows you bloom times and beneficial insect information, and also gives you a link to the, the native plant link exchange that we maintain that will show you where, in, where that plant is available in California, uh, or at least what nurseries at one time told us it, they had it. Um, and, cool. Yeah, uh, it's it's rudimentary. It's this is for this is for NRCS staff, and they use it. It does what they need, um, but it's kind of shown us that I think there's a potential to connect nurseries with landscapers and gardeners, um, and have just an, a, an easy system. Well, let me show you the system actually. Um, so um, Napa RCD got excited at the idea of this and wanted to be able to make it available. So you're saying that's available to the public now. The, the, yes, the, the last one, the eVeg guide is. Yeah. yeah. And it's somewhat limited utility because it's these, um, these very formalized um, conservation practices. So conservation practice 824 is these plants under these conditions. It's, it's a cookbook for their staff. Um, and it includes plants that probably, some of those plants are things that none of us would ever want to plant. Um, we've got them to remove some of the listed weeds from the practices, uh, but it's a, you know, it's, a federal agency and things are slow moving and, and it's it's very specialized. So it's for things it's for soil conservation. It's not for bio, biodiversity conservation or landscaping. And Napa RCD saw the value in that but wanted it improved. So they came to us. They got a grant um, to hire uh, the lead engineer at Cal Flora, John Malpass, who's built a lot of these miracle tools to take those practices and give them a system that would let them modify it, remove the plants they don't like, add some plants that are important for folks in Napa. Um, add bloom times and beneficial insect associations, pollinators and beneficial insect associations. Um, and so John is cranking on this. He needs to have it done for release by July 31st um, with um, probably a month or so of, of, you know, of um, you know, close friends checking it out uh, before we start publicizing it in September. But the idea is to have a site that RCDs, resource conservation districts, and landscapers and homeowners, anyone who wants to plant stuff, can go here, um, click on the map, select their practice, um, and, and get a planting list, and then sort it by, use it to screen for plants that have the pollinators or beneficial insects that they want. You know, a tomato farmer can say, I want these pollinators. Um, a, a butterfly lover can say, I want these pollinators. And then pull up the bloom times. There's a little bloom time illustration, just kind of a pie chart with 12 slices that are yellow unless something's blooming, in which case it's blue. So it's very easy to just look at it and make sure that your pie chart's filled, that there's always something in bloom that that pollinator likes at any time of the year. So we're working on this. Um, it's customized for Napa, and, and they wanted us to build it so that it could be customized by other RCDs, so that, that, so that with just adding a little additional information to be available to other resource conservation districts around the state. We're working on it with Xerxes. It looks like Point Reyes Bird Observatory wants to join in and add a climate change appropriateness element to it. Um, so it's a growing concern, and, uh, and I think there's something in there for us, especially in, in as much as it connects with an, a native plant nursery inventory. And I think that a problem a lot of us face as na native plant gardeners uh, is that it's not always easy to get native plants, or especially to get things that are really local. Um, there's kind of an information disconnect between the folks who love to grow them and the folks who want to buy them. Um, and, and it seems to me that this is the kind of system that can help connect those, increase demand, increase supply, um, and make it so that we can really do better native plant gardening, not just native plant gardening. Um, so these are the kind of things that I think can help us improve. I just threw this in here to, to, to finish talking about the manager module where um, the idea is that we, we start doing true adaptive management where we define our stuff, we identify the information gaps, we, we, we take action, we track our outcome, we evaluate whether it worked, and then we use that information to improve our action next time. Um, so we start doing good planning, because that's what we need to do to save the things that we love in California. We need to do a better job of aggregating the information that will let us make good decisions. We need to be able to connect all the dots to see the big picture, and you have to have dots to be able to connect them. Um, so getting plant, plant location, species, latitude, longitude. That's the fundamental part. If you want to add photos, if you want to add anything else, that's even more valuable. But just a dot on the map, 
Um, one dot at a time adds up to good information that we can use to make good decisions. Um, not just for land managers to decide what to remove or what to plant, but so that we can have good maps that we can take early on in the process of things like desert solar or OHV, off-road vehicle planning, and, and show people good maps of what's growing there and show them other sites where there's nothing growing and, and they're, they're welcome to, to, to stick something there. Um, having that kind of information, it's, it, people are collecting plant location information all the time um, and we're just losing it. And if we can hang on to it, we have some powerful tools to, to help us do better conservation. This is Mount Tam, which um, bioclimatic envelope modeling, models that look at the range of a plant under the current climate and then say, well, what if climate changed and look at where that, where that plant's going to be distributed under those conditions. Those models show that places like Mount Tam are really important. Mount Tam came out as one of the great refugia of the future. It's got some elevation, it's close to the coast. Many plants that are going to lose their ranges, many plants will lose their ranges in California, except for if they're able to go to Mount Tam or Mount Shasta or these crazy places. Uh, so we need to save Mount Tam, but we also, it's not just a rep, it's not going to be a refuge in the future if we don't get rid of things like this licorice plant, licorice plant, helichrysum pediculari, great landscaping plant, um, almost never invasive except for basically this one population. Um, it's planted all over the place and you, I've never seen it invade anywhere. I've never seen it escape aggressively except here. And there's something about this genotype that's spreading like wildfire. And so you can see that even though Mount Tam comes out, you know, mathematically it's important in the future, it's going to be useless to these California plants. Even if they can get there, there's no bare soil for them to grow on. So we need plant distribution information to be able to make good conservation decisions today um, so that things have a future. And, and it's also just kind of cool. This is a, a patch of Gary Oak out on the coast by Mount, uh, by, um, out on the coast by Tomales National, Tomales um, Bay that looked like a patch of willows up on this old fossil sand dune. And as Peter Bay and I went to survey this site, and as we got closer, we thought that it was some, some uh, coast live oak. And as we got closer, we realized that it was Gary Oak, and Peter thinks it's an undescribed variety, or an undescribed ecotype or something. Um, and and, and he's, we're both fairly convinced that um, it's, it's somewhat anomalous to be finding it right there on the coast. It's something that likes to be a little bit further inland around here. Um, but 15,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago, that wasn't right on the coast. The Farallons were, were closer to the coastline. Um, and it's, I just like this because even though it's a really bad photo and very fuzzy, um, it reminds me that these things are just always changing. Uh, this population has probably been stranded there since, since a time that Native Americans could walk to the Farallons. Um, and sea level rose and, and these got stranded here. Um, and populations moved around, but everything that we love out there survived that, level, that, that period of sea level rise. There's a rate of sea level rise comparable to what we're expecting in the future. Um, so none of this is unprecedented. Uh, things have happened before. Populations were larger. They didn't have malls that they had to move around. Um, uh, so they had an easier time adapting back then, but I think they're going to be able to adapt to the stuff we're throwing at them now, um, so long as we, we do the best that we can to save them figure out where they are, we protect them from things, we don't accidentally build on top of a significant population, um, and we're careful in moving things around. Um, we need a system where um, folks can do locally native plants easily, um, and, and folks who want to do really aggressive translocations um, have, have tools to guide them in, in doing careful evaluations before they move things too far. Um, I think it's important just to let the, those evolutionary stories continue because they're going to continue with or without us. 50,000 years from now, we're not going to be here. And it'd be nice if those stories were unbroken. Um, and, 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 uh, and, uh, yeah. So th these are some of the partners and funders who supported uh, the work that I just told you about. I um, just want to say thank you to all of these folks. And you already know that they're fantastic entities. Um, and that's my contact info, <laughs> at least for the time, if you want to get in touch with me and uh, get involved or send any ideas or suggestions.
Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, uh, does your Cal Flora application uh, play well with those other uh, programs yet, or is that yeah. the future? Yeah, yeah, so we've, um, data collected through iNaturalist um, are available through Cal Flora. So you can pull those data in. We have a, we have a feed, um, uh, both a live feed and a static feed. So we don't just pull them in on, on demand, but they're actually accessioned as records. Okay, but um, there is a direct connection. There is a direct connection. Um, the, the, and they're not automatically displayed. You have to kind of opt in. A little pop-up window, when you, say, when you click the box to show those records, you get a little pop-up window that says, warning, these are citizen science the records, identification, maybe, I'm not sure exactly what it says, but it warns people. Um, because, you know, for birds and, and other animals, um, citizen science identifications are, are better, but for plants, a lot of the time, they can get a little yeah, yeah, well, so some of us are docents with the Space Authority, and that's the program they've chosen. Okay. So yeah. Trying to act as a reasonably competent bridge. Yeah, yeah. And and we're, we, we provide INAP with the, the, the um, the county distribution information that they make available on their website, so that's from Cal Flora. And, um, and I'm not sure if we have this operational layout yet, but, um, but we also, either we do or we're going to send them our unknowns or, or observations that have been, records in Cal Flora that have been flagged as needing, um, uh, needing further inspection. Um, and those get sent to INAT in the hopes that, um, hopefully they'll build a user community that kind of has a critical mass to, to go out and check on things and do a little bit of identification and confirmities. So, trying to build a, kind of an integrated system that... Is there anything that you can use right now to find out what the best practices are for eradicating a particular weed or... Yeah, yeah. Um, the, you know, a good place to go for that is the California Invasive Plant Council. I think okay. there's probably some stuff available on their website. Um, and links to other resources. And it varies depending on the plant. Um, so some plants, um, there's good information available, and others, um, it can be hard to find the best practices, the best techniques. The Nature Conservancy also has some really good sites. I'm sorry? The Nature Conservancy, so if you just Google the Nature Conservancy sure. we, um, you can get to their sites. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I measured uh, weeds in there, and I never noticed if there was anything said what the entry I had, what level it was at. How do I control that? The, um, Where does that control? The level of? Publication or oh. private or whatever yeah. I put in. Yeah, totally. Okay. So when you go to, when you. I'll find it here, I think. Okay, cool. <laughs> and, and for everyone else, you can go to Cal Flora. The main Cal Flora page um, is hiding a lot. Um, if you want to find that hidden stuff, you go on the left-hand side, there's a little link that says My Cal Flora. So if you click on that, um, there will be a, a, a list of things, you know, my groups, my observations, and those are all your personal things. So you can click on my observations, and that's your personal library where you can publish and publish stuff like that. So <clears throat> I thought your, your example about cholera was pretty good because you saw they identified, or they identified the pump, which was the sort of distribution of the disease. So have, have you looked at anything like that? So you've got these AD and you're trying to eradicate them, but how do you prevent them from coming back or mm -hmm. you know, getting moved from places? Do you have, have you tried to address any of those types of problems? Yeah, yeah, oh, good question. Um, we, yeah, we did try. So those are early detection priority species. Um, in, in developing that, we looked, we actually, we, we pulled out data not just for the nine counties of the Bay Area, but also for surrounding counties. So we tried to find things that were sparsely distributed in the Bay Area and, and in the immediate periphery, with the, you know, running on the assumption that things that are, if there's a large population nearby, it's gonna get in more easily. Obviously, it's a complicated world, and San Diego is not as far away as the map might, might show. You know, things can, things can move long distances quickly. But that was kind of the best we could do um, for this operation for the Bay Area operation. And that's one of the advantages of having a California early detection network that is really looking on a much larger scale and looking at you know, multi-county level patches of things. So something might be an early detection candidate in Northern California and San Diego County, but you know, too abundant in the middle to be able to be, be more detailed in that analysis. And then on the prevention side, that's the most important thing. It seems like 
historically we're going at things backwards. We start by spending a couple decades of investing money in the least important thing, managing large established populations. And we spent a couple decades going after these big weed patches that are, are really doing great harm to systems we love. And then, and then more recently we've started investing in early detection and rapid response. And now we're started, starting to invest in really the most important thing, prevention. Um, in making sure that people clean their boots, in trying to prevent the worst of the invaders from getting into the nursery crate, and um, using best practices to clean equipment and maintain roadsides. So prevention is the cheapest and most effective. When that fails, early detection and rapid response is the next cheapest, most effective. And when that fails, you've got to spend a lot of money and a lot of time managing something that you may have to manage in perpetuity, but, but you, know, you have to. Oh, uh, what about, you know, you talk to, you're, you're talking about, you know, eradicating plants that, you know, may be harmful, but what about those plants that are in the nursery trade where there might be, you know, tens of thousands of them and it's going to be a little hard to go to somebody's yard and rip them up? Yeah, yeah, fortunately there's not too many of those. Um, um, and I think it, I think, I think the nursery trade was dirtier um, just a few years ago, just a decade ago. Um, when you could go to a lot of nurseries and get pampas grass, um, uh, chubata grass, um, uh, uh, French broom, um, uh, some, some, some stuff that for the most part has been removed from the market. There's still, there's still nurseries that sell stuff, but um, the Sustainable Conservation has created a plant right program um, with partners in the nursery industry and Nature Conservancy and California Native Plant Society and other entities to work together over a number of years to discuss how to get the really invasive stuff out of the industry. And fundamentally, it's in the interest of the, of the nursery industry to get that stuff out. Uh, they, they, as an industry, they don't want to be selling invaders. And as an industry, they probably want people ripping stuff out of their yard and going to the store and buying new stuff to plant. Uh, but it took a few years to, to build goodwill and develop a list of things that everyone agreed are, are bad actors and shouldn't be sold. And for a year, um, Materials were put together to connect with wholesale growers um, and distributors and say, these are bad plants. In a year, we're going to go to retailers and ask them to remove them, and we're going to do a public outreach campaign to let the public know not to buy them. We're telling you ahead of time, so finish up what you're growing, don't grow anymore. Um, so it was very non-confrontational, uh, very smooth, and over a couple of years, a lot of that stuff is left. There are some interesting ones that um, are on the Baden list, um, Budlia davidii. Beautiful, beautiful plant, uh, great wildlife plant, uh, very rarely invasive, but there are invasive genotypes out there. Um, Washington and Oregon have terrible problems with the plant, and we've got a couple populations in the Bay Area that are proving to be very aggressive. Um, uh, and a couple others like that. There are a couple species that are in the trade um, that become invasive in certain conditions. And for those, we need to have a more nuanced approach where obviously it's not a, it's not a regional eradication target, but when you find a population in a wildland, in a conservation area, that's expanding, um, eradicate it cheap, while it's cheap. Are the ones that they say in the trade that are sterile, are they in fact sterile? Is it safe to plant those? That's a good question. <laughs> I, what was the one that was sterile? If plants are listed as sterile, are they really sterile? As in French broom. No. Sterile French, French broom. Well, I'm yeah. asking more about the budlias. Yeah. That's a big element of discussion for, for plant right right now. There's a steering committee meeting next week, and they sent me a bunch of uh, scientific papers on that issue. We're, we're, gonna, we're supposed to have an enlightened, an informed discussion of it, and I haven't read them yet. So <laughs> I'm sorry. But apparently there is question about it. Um, and, you know, in all, in all things biological and all things with plants, the answer is it depends. And so the question is, under what conditions, yeah. for which species, yeah. Yeah. But, um, but look into it a little bit more. If, if, if your instincts are telling you that it's invasive, if you see it invading elsewhere, um, but the pot or the retailer is telling you, no, no, it's okay, look into it a little bit more would be my recommendation until I read the paper.